Well, good evening. Thank you for coming. Let me tell you what our format is, is going to be tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit <clears throat> to start about the Abraham Lincoln transition to the presidency. And then uh, the governor is going to talk a bit about the current transition to the presidency. Parallels, differences, whatever is on his mind. Then we'll dialogue a little bit because while I've been trained to agree with everything he says, he doesn't agree with anything I say. And then we'll, um, we'll let you ask some questions. Hopefully we'll have time for you to join the discussion. Well, the night he was elected president, a relatively inexperienced, lanky, big-eared candidate from Illinois who had defeated the senator from New York for his party's nomination after a grueling and divisive fight sat with his friends as the votes came in and reacted this way, God help me. <laughs> his name was Abraham Lincoln. The night he was elected president, a relatively inexperienced, lanky, big-eared candidate from Illinois who had defeated the senator from New York for his party's nomination after a grueling fight, said in effect, Abraham Lincoln help me. This is what Barack Obama declared, and I quote, as Lincoln said to a nation far more divided than ours, we are not enemies but friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. There's actually double irony here because those words from Lincoln were actually drafted by the senator from New York who thought he was going to be president. Not quite those words, because one of the reasons maybe that William Seward didn't become president is that he couldn't write like Abraham Lincoln. This is, the, this is fascinating. This is the words that Seward suggested. Although passion has strained our bonds of affection too hardly, they must not, I am sure, they will not be broken. Out of that kind of earnest but prosaic sentiment came, though passion may have strained it, must not break our bonds of affection. And that's the difference, I think, between talent and, and genius, between an idea and inspiration. Well, I'm gonna leave um, Senator Obama to the governor. I just, I, I would like to point out something very comforting that's come to light in the last few days, and that's the fact that the, at least it's comforting for me, the uh, January 20th, 2009 inaugural has officially been themed for Abraham Lincoln. Um, this was Senator Feinstein's idea with Senator Obama, and uh, they haven't decided how this is gonna manifest itself. Um, we'll see, but uh, for Senator Obama, like Lincoln, it's all about the words, so I have a feeling um, it will be the words that will be emphasized. And of course, the links that are so interesting and the parallels represent a, a story whose ending has not been written yet but I think we all recognize um, that the opening chapters of this current story have helped complete what Abraham Lincoln in Gettysburg in 1863 and what Mario Cuomo in Gettysburg in 1991 called America's Unfinished Work, closing one chapter of American history even as it opens another. Anyway, time is short. My Time alone is short, so I do want to talk a bit about the Lincoln transition, the period that is, was known as, and is the subtitle of my book, The Great Secession Winter of 1860-1861, when all hell broke loose. But what I'm going to do, and, and what the book tries to show, is that Lincoln's reputation as president-elect, which has been very low, certainly compared to that of his presidency, deserves a re-examination. That, in fact, he did a much better job than we've given him credit for. But let me start with the challenges that he faced after Election Day. Okay, I'm gonna just run off with, the, with these bullet by bullet. One, he had a clear electoral majority, but he only won 39% of the popular vote. Um, it was the most lopsided regional election in history Lincoln won only about 3% or 2% of the votes in the southern states where his name was allowed to be on the ballot. In 10 states, his name wasn't on the ballot. Even in the north, which he swept, save for New Jersey, we all know that's always a problem, 
he only got 56 percent, 55, 56 percent of the vote in the North, so 45 percent of the North was also arrayed against him. 60 percent of the country was against him. His election wasn't secure on election day, even though he got this clear electoral majority. He felt, and his aides, his friends felt, that it was entirely possible that the state electors who met on December 5th in their various state capitals would not ratify this vote, and that the electoral college that convened in Washington in February would do something to upset the apple cart. Lincoln himself thought that the great danger to his presidency was in the electoral college. What if the South doesn't come, what if there's no quorum, what if something happens? So he was never even certain about his election. Of course, seven states reacted to his election by quitting, by leaving the Union between December and, and February. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. What followed was the seizure of federal property in southern states and the indifference of the incumbent president at best indifference, he also added hostility. In those days, the sitting president got one last State of the Union address, then known as the annual message. Buchanan gave an annual message that said, the states are all leaving the Union, it's not the Southern state's fault, it's the fault of the Republican Party, they did it. At best, Lincoln has an alternate, an alternative alternate president, Jefferson Davis, elected in February to be president of this alternative government, the Confederacy. Confederate States of America, and that the moment that Lincoln has been yearning for and planning his inaugural journey that he hopes will be his greatest triumph, Jefferson Davis undertakes an equally publicized journey from Mississippi to Alabama to assume the presidency. With all this, with all of these challenges, Lincoln had no advisory infrastructure. He didn't have a Rahm Emanuel who he appointed on day one. He had a staff of two, um, a, a German-born clerk, professional clerk, um, who was ever thus in, his, in the rest of his career, a new, former newspaper editor from Illinois. He appointed a deputy, John Hay, who later became a famous Secretary of State under McKinley and TR, but that was it. That was the staff. No email, of course, no telephones. The communication challenges were vast. He had to stay in touch with, with the Republican leaders in Washington, but could only do, throw, do so through private and confidential letters. Difficult, time consuming. During this period, both the House and the Senate offer compromise plans to thwart the Republican platform, to take the initiative away from the president-elect before he becomes president. A peace convention meets in Washington at the Willard Hotel. When he gets to Washington, he finds that there's a peace convention going on, trying to subvert his incoming administration and pass a, a constitutional amendment that would have enshrined slavery forever and extended slavery west to California. He has to fight that, even as he's registering in the hotel and throwing out the, the delegate who was occupying the hotel suite he was supposed to uh, occupy. Guess what state he was from? New York. <laughs> a bombardment of job seekers. You know, he had open office hours open office hours, people lined up, and from 9 to 11 every day, they came in and asked for favors, they threatened him, they, they, and speaking of threats, daily death threats, and yet no real security in, until he leaves for Washington when he had a record uh, kind of security. Demands that he speak out, conciliate the South, and demands that he be quiet, because if he conciliates the South, he gets the North upset. If he's too hostile, he gets the Northern Democrats upset. He has the most fragile of coalitions. We'll just speak out, his friends say, and say you're not going to do any harm. And he said, I won't be sycophantic. I won't beg for the privilege that this election has, has given me. I won't be a sucked egg, all shell and no substance in it. By the way, during this period, um, Lincoln's wife, unlike Mrs. Obama, goes on the road to New York and begins agitating for her own choices for the cabinet. And in one moment, she's seen in uh, their home in Springfield, somebody comes to visit him to ask for a job, and he, he stumbles into the parlor, and there is Mrs. Lincoln on the floor, face down, and Lincoln sitting forlornly in, in his chair, and, and the man says, I beg your pardon, 
uh, Mr. Lincoln, I hope everything's all right. He said, oh, it's just Mrs. Lincoln. She said that she's not going to get up off the floor unless the person she wants to be a postmaster is appointed. <laughs> No speechwriters, no seclusion, barely, and he has to hide above his brother-in-law's store to write um, his inaugural address, which he wrote above a grocery store, Governor. Um, no access to his predecessor until he gets to Washington. A thousand miles of travel. Of course, he didn't just take a plane uh, to, to his inauguration. A thousand miles of travel, speeches at every state capital, at every legislature from uh, Indianapolis to Columbus to Albany to Trenton to Philadelphia and Harrisburg all the way to Washington. Um, despite all of these challenges, despite this lingering myth that he vacillated and hid during the secession winter, I think he did an, a, an astonishing number of things with all of this daily pressure, everything happening concurrently. And very briefly, he refused to give in on slavery. He could have compromised. He could have said, let the peace convention take the blame for it, but he wouldn't do it because any compromise that invited the southern states back in would have basically enshrined slavery for another 50 years. He created somehow, not even knowing the people he was appointing, a, one of the most brilliant administrations, as Doris Goodwin has shown, ever assembled for a cabinet. He politically remade the government uh, class through the power of appointments, which was important because he got 20 years of pro-slavery Democrats out of the federal bureaucracy. He crafted some brilliant speeches for his journey, culminating in one of the great inaugural addresses uh, in American history, somewhat overshadowed by his second, but quite brilliant as well. And he created in the bargain a new image as a wise and avuncular bearded statesman, um, somehow ready, readier for the crisis than the rail splitter who had won the election. And, and most remarkable of all to me, when he passes through Baltimore in secrecy, en route to Washington, on the final leg of this 11-day journey, which he's tried to plan so carefully, but is convinced he has to sneak through Baltimore, maybe even wearing a disguise, um, to arrive safely to evade a credible assassination plot. He somehow maintains or regains his bearings, poses for photographers, goes publicly to church, meets with Democrats, calls on the president, calls on Congress, receives all three of his election opponents at the Willard Hotel, calls on Chief Justice Roger Tawney, his lifelong, well, 10-year-long enemy, the author of the hated Dred Scott decision, and somehow, within a week after the Baltimore disaster, regains the respect of the North, able to take control of the country. That was Lincoln's secession winter, and we're still in the autumn of, uh, the autumn of Senator Obama, but with that, I will hand it off to a man who knows transitions, uh, Governor Cuomo. Thank you very much, Harold. Let me uh, get something clear at the very beginning. Harold and I worked together for a uh, long time, and we've been friends for a long time. He tells you that uh, he has been trained um, to believe what I say. <laughs> well, the truth is, tonight he told me what to say. <laughs> And I'm going to I'm going to do only one, a little bit of what he asked me to do. Um, the uh, among other things, uh, Harold has said that uh, Lincoln refused to give in to slavery and uh, extending slavery. That is, and of course that's true. But we have to keep in mind he also um, didn't say anything about ending slavery. As a matter of fact, he made a very strong point. Uh, throughout uh, his early years as president, reminding people that he didn't have the power to end slavery. Uh, and so, so we have to keep that in mind. There are significant similarities and some significant differences, I think, between Lincoln and Obama. One of the small differences is that uh, Lincoln had 117 days to deal with between his election and his uh, swearing in while Obama has only 77 uh, days. I think that's more an advantage than a disadvantage for Obama. Um, the chores that Lincoln dealt with, as you've heard, uh, you've heard some of them from uh, Harold, selecting a cabinet, selecting a staff, drafting an inaugural address, and his uh, attention to party matters, to political matters, uh, were all tasks that Obama's con confronted with as well. The biggest difference to me between Obama's period now, between 
election and swearing in. And Lincoln's is the nature of the issues that confronted the two of them. You've, you've heard Harold tell you the uh, problems that, uh, or the challenges were Harold's word that Lincoln uh, faced. And indeed, there were many of them. But uh, basically, they came down to two things. One was the formidable challenge of uh, the demand for the extension of slavery. And so the one thing he had to deal with was his position on slavery and their position on slavery. And the other thing was how to keep the union together while that argument was going on, an argument that was to become a law. Obama, on the other hand, has dozens of extremely serious issues facing him immediately. And that difference, the difference between the seriousness of uh, the many problems Obama is facing and what Lincoln was confronted with was uh, the difference was most evident in Lincoln's masterful inaugural, which was all about slavery and preserving the Union and nothing else. As a matter of fact, in writing the speech, Lincoln dismissed all the other issues that he might be facing at the very top of the speech, considering them as lacking in, in his words, anxiety or excitement. So Lincoln was all about that, those two questions that were really a tandem. Uh, the one, slavery and people who are importuning him to do this and do that about slavery, uh, guaranteeing that it would remain, et cetera, et cetera. He had to deal with that, but at the same time, he had to try to keep the union together in making that stand. Obama, on the other hand, faces two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan a threatened third war with Iran. He also needs to stay focused on the ongoing struggle with world terrorism by keeping us safe from another attack, which we must concede the Bush administration has done successfully since 9-11. At the same time, he must deal with our worst financial and economic problems since the Great Depression. Lincoln didn't speak out on the questions that were troubling him in that period, uh, according to some Lincoln scholars, because he was confused about what to do and didn't understand the real dangers of secession. Some of the uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, lauded of the uh, historians uh, who focus on Lincoln have taken that position. Harold, on the other hand, has taken a different view. And I suspect, uh, knowing Harold and after reading his book, that after the world has read his book, uh, some of those experts will be conferred, converted to his more favorable view of Lincoln's silence. As a matter of, think, uh, as a matter of fact, I think David Donald has indicated that uh, while Donald's own book on Lincoln is, is already a classic, at least in my opinion, uh, and he's very clear in his book about what he thought about Lincoln's period as a failure and a bad start to the presidency. Well, I think I, I understand he's... <laughs> He's been convinced by uh, Harold to take another look at that, and uh, that's all to Harold's credit. Uh, Obama, like Lincoln, acknowledges that we have only one president at a time. He's said that already four or five times, but he's already chosen to speak out, to assure, and he speaks, uh, he's spoken out very uh, clearly, especially to people around the world. Uh, but to people around the country and the world, he has said he will continue to pursue the federal remedies that have been invented to deal with our financial and economic calamities. Uh, but he's spoken out on foreign policy, I think, even more interestingly. He has made the point that he's going to meet with the Muslim world, which I was delighted to hear, because for uh, uh, years now we've been trying to make the point that there are a billion Muslims and the jihadists, who are the terrorists, are only a very tiny, tiny percentage of that. And so um, Obama has indicated that he wishes to convene a meeting of the Muslim world, and he will be uh, present at it, trying to recruit them uh, to assist in dealing with the uh, uh, handful, comparatively, of troublesome jihadists who they regard as a, a desecration of the Koran in their activities. It's fair to say that Lincoln's period in history certainly produced serious problems to deal with, but more than a century of globalization since then uh, has produced a whole lot of other 
huge, much larger problems for Obama. Just think a little bit about it. Uh, world wars, the ugly birth of nuclear weapons, which we will have to take credit for, and now the proliferation of those weapons of mass destruction, which are threatening the entire globe, as is global warming, world poverty, pandemic disease, all of this happening at the same time uh, in this country and uh, around the world. And so this is a much more dangerous world than the one Lincoln was born to. Lincoln, like Obama, needed assistance with foreign policy and turned to his early opponent, Governor Seward, as you've heard. Obama has not yet chosen his Secretary of State, but it may very well be <coughs> a, a former opponent, at least with respect to what party they're in. Uh, he may very well select a Republican, and a number of Republican possibilities have been suggested. Senators Lugar and Hagel and even Robert Gates, who is now Secretary of Defense, has been uh, mentioned as a possibility for Secretary of State. If not, um, and it's also been suggested that perhaps he'll keep Gates on, and I hope he does, not just because that gives us <clears throat> a little evidence of his bipartisanship, which is something that I think is good and useful, and he has promised. The two presidents elect are similar in their desire to be bipartisan, um, and I think that's a very good thing. I mean, the one thing that both of them did, and this is a point that I think we should think more and more about nowadays, is uh, that rigid ideology is ridiculous and an obstruction to common sense and progress. Uh, I, my own position uh, has been for a long time that while there is a place for ideology in a very broad way, some, some major commitments to taking care of the poor, et cetera, the, the test uh, for whether or not your governmental activity is a good thing or a bad thing should come down to common sense and benign pragmatism. You should take every issue as it arises and consider it on its own merits instead of applying some ideological test to it. And I say benign uh, prog uh, pragmatism. Uh, because with a name like Mario Cuomo, if you say simply pragmatism, they think you're Machiavelli. Uh, and, and, and people are confused. They believe pragmatism is a bad thing. Pragmatism is not a bad thing. Pragmatism means it works. So I add the word benign to me. It works to help good people around the world. And uh, both of them, I think, have felt that way. A number of Republican possibilities have been named. I told you about it. Lincoln and Obama also thought, also thought of themselves as someone preparing to be president because neither of them had real executive experience. Both were incredibly gifted personally with high intelligence and extraordinary speaking ability. I've said of Obama, he is the best combination of God's gifts in a politician that I've witnessed in my lifetime. Uh, both had vice presidents. Lincoln had Hamlin, who was, I guess, Harold would agree, a non-factor. But Obama's Biden clearly has proved already to be a consequential choice. There's one difference between the two that has not been highlighted as far as I can tell, and I have noticed it, and uh, it uh, discomforts me. Lincoln, I, I, I remember in a debate with Gingrich, uh, I think it was in, uh, in 204, uh, the, uh, Charlie Rose, who was the moderator of the debate, said to uh, the audience and to me that, uh, he was, uh, that Gingrich maintains that uh, George Bush was very, very religious, and he had a Bible, and he spoke about the Bible, and George Bush was always talking about God and going to church, et cetera, et cetera, and that was just like Lincoln. And uh, he said, isn't that so, Governor? And I said, well, I don't think it's so. I mean, Lincoln referred a lot to God and even to Christ, but he <clears throat> wasn't really religious. And uh, uh, yeah, and he, he referred to talking even to God. But the difference between Bush and Lincoln when it came to uh, relationships with God was that Lincoln was saying he talked to God. Bush was saying God talked to Bush. <laughs> And that's a very big difference. And, and, and frankly, if that was true, I don't think he understood her. <laughs> oh, 
Now, but here, getting serious about it, Obama says he is a true believer, a Christian true believer, and that's fine with me, except that he goes on to say, and that's why he can't be for same-sex marriage. Now, when you, when you say you're a true believer, uh, well, that's fine and suitable to our democracy. Everybody's free. First Amendment give us, gives us that right, thank God, to say things like thank God if we wish to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you say that that's the reason for my policy, then what you're suggesting is a violation at least of the spirit of the First Amendment because you shouldn't be making laws on the basis of your religious belief alone, and I underscore alone. And that's what Obama appears to be saying, that same-sex marriage, I won't call it marriage because that violates my religion. That is precisely the position that uh, the current President Bush has taken with respect to embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells uh, uh, are cherished now by science. They think that they're very valuable things, and uh, they've asked the President, the scientists have, and the, many of the rest of us have, for help in uh, finding ways to, to work with embryonic stem cells. And the President's position has been no, I will not cooperate. And as a matter of fact, Obama said he will change that position because it's a position that wasn't done by law but by a presidential uh, mandate. He says, I can't do that because my religion prevents me from doing it, because my religion tells me human life begins at conception. And if that's true, it changes everything with respect to abortion, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very important point. Somehow it has slipped past us, I think, in the, in the race, uh, because no one's made a point of it. I'm, I'm making a point of it now, and I will continue to. Lincoln is thought of by many as the greatest president we ever had. Obama is thought of by many as having the potential to be another great president, and even without doing more. Obama's victory on November 4th, 2008, will forever be considered a significant elaboration of Lincoln's eventual triumph over slavery's unfairness and oppressiveness, which happened really after Lincoln, but only because of Lincoln. Um, and I, I think then, uh, for the rest, uh, I think we have to get back to Harold to see what other things he uh, wants me to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, can I take issue with a few things you, you said? Uh, you certainly can, but right. be gentle. All right. Let me just do one parallel that I forgot to talk about, which is sort of interesting. Um, two weeks before he left for, uh, well, let me start it another way. A day, two days before the election, about two days, Senator Obama went back to his childhood home to visit uh, the woman who, not his mother, but the woman who raised him for a tearful reunion, uh, knowing that it was the last time he would see her. Um, and we all know how poignant that was and what happened. It was the last time she passed away, tragically, the day before her grandson was elected president. A week before leaving for Washington, Lincoln went back to his, well, not childhood home, but his young adult home on the prairie in Illinois, and there had a tearful reunion with the woman, not his mother, who had raised him, his stepmother, Sarah. Um, and he probably suspected, as she was nearing 80 years old, that it would be the last time he would see her. She tugged at his sleeve when he was leaving and said, I know it's the last time I'll see you because I know they're going to kill you. Oh. And that was their last, uh, their last meeting. So <laughs> it's sort of a little, another parallel we can put in the book. Um, only, you, you took an interesting twist on things, basically only 77 days to prepare. That's a negative for Obama, that he's only got 77 days. Lincoln was so itching to go to Washington, he found it unbearable. He said at times that he'd, he'd like to hang himself because he was so anxious, he was so angry that, and then he changed his mind and said it's Buchanan who should be hanged because he's allowing the federal property to be seized before he can get there. He was petrified that the Congress, the lame duck Congress, and this crazy peace convention um, would, would undermine the Republican platform, which people took, very ser people took platforms quite seriously in those days, and enact an extension of slavery all the way to the Pacific, which would include all areas below, meaning the potential annexation of Cuba, the annexation of 
Mexico, Lower Mexico, and other areas to add to the slave empire, which would have perpetuated slavery and Southern dominance in Congress in behalf of the slave interest forever. I mean, there was no end in sight. And whether Lincoln did it because he hated slavery, because he hated the Democrats' control on the Congress, he hated it and he didn't want it to be done. You know, imagine if, if well, there is another parallel. I'm jumping a little, but President Bush said, and I think he had all good intentions, that um, he was gonna have a World Economic Summit. I think it starts next week. And he said whoever wins the presidency is invited to attend the World Economic Summit. And I said to myself, when I heard it, Lincoln never would have done it. FDR wouldn't do it. Same, he would not enter any compacts or conversations with Hoover on substantive issues, even though people were petrified, as they are now, and as they were then. Um, Obama, by the way, has said he, you know, as you pointed out, Gov, in, with respect, he's, President Bush is the president, and he, he declines with respect to attend the economic summit. So Lincoln gets to Washington. The head of the peace convention is one of five vexatious living presidents, none of whom have a good thing to say about Abraham Lincoln, ex-presidents, um, including the guy who becomes uh, chairman of the, uh, of the peace convention, John Tyler of Virginia, a slaveholder, whose greatest uh, achievement in life was that he, uh, even as president, he was an accidental president, was that he was the father of 19 children. That was his major accomplishment. When he gets to the peace convention, he's elected not chairman, but president of how the many, peace convention. Uh, how many wives did he Two. Have? Two? I knew you'd ask that. I was ready. Well, I, I think the wives de de deserve more of the credit. They, <laughs> <laughs> One died, as you would expect. Um, so he has this peace convention. He has to meet them in, in, in Willard's Hotel and, and establish himself with them and make it clear he's not going to... Um, to, uh, to acquiesce. He also had something of a financial crisis. I just want to add to his burdens because you've made the point that you think Obama is more burdened. He had a financial crisis, the stock market declined. Yeah. When Excuse Lincoln me, was are you saying you don't think Obama has more burdens? I'm saying I don't think Obama has more burdens. Really? Yes. Yeah. Three possible, a possible war, two ongoing wars, mm -hmm. possibility of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and they're, they're all over Russia. All we need is one bad argument. The Israelis have dropped another bomb on Syria. Um, if they do it in Iran, you may have a world war. And uh, Lincoln you had still think of, Lincoln, but Lincoln, Lincoln not only had weapons of mass destruction, obviously for the time they were yeah, considered. It was like mis destruction. You know? he, 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 was a big fan of military technology. This guy who yeah. didn't even like to shoot a rifle. But he didn't, allowed have, he iron didn't clads. have a nuclear weapon. He had, um, you know, this um, kind of acid rain kind of fire that was just considered to be grotesquely inappropriate. He encouraged it. He had ironclad battleships built here in Brooklyn and Greenpoint uh, to level unheard of warfare. I'm, I'm getting, Gatling guns. I'm getting closer Everything and closer to Donald's original position. <laughs> <laughs> no, no let, me, let, let me, but you, 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 before you go. What Obama anyway. didn't have is the nation dissolving. He didn't have, he had the red and the blue, which he's putting together. Lincoln had the blue and the gray, which is a lot harder. The, you said 77 days is something that uh, uh, Obama, uh, Lincoln would have been pleased to have right. instead of the 117. Uh, it's interesting. The, um, I, I'm not sure that it's an advantage or a disadvantage to Obama to have 77 days. I, sometimes I feel it would be better if he had only seven. There are practical reasons, because there's so much work to do, and everybody knows there's so much work to do that I, I'd like to see him get on with the work as soon as possible. Uh, on the other hand, um, normally you'd need a whole lot of days just to pick your cabinet and staff, because they have to be uh, uh, looked at very carefully, you have to do inspections, et cetera, et cetera. The, that is not happening. Um, although Obama ran <clears throat> on a change and ran specifically against Hillary Clinton by saying she was the old politics, which meant that she and her husband were the old politics. He has started by using mostly Clinton people. Mm -hmm. And so the, his, he is staffing up with John Podesta and Rahm Emanuel 
and Larry Summers and all of these people who worked for Clinton. Now, I think that's a good thing because you need experience. It also shortens the need for time because these are people who have been uh, looked at uh, carefully uh, before. Um, so, so there's, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I, again, I hope that, and I suspect that Obama may, before the end of the period, start being a lot more overt in what he in, intends to do. Because um, they're, they're having a dispute already between uh, himself and uh, President Bush on how exactly to handle the, the bailout package mm -hmm. and whether or not to give money to, Amer to General Motors, et cetera, et cetera. So but that remains to be seen. But I don't think he's going to go this whole 77 days without being very much more active. And there's much more communications demand yeah. now. They, they, obviously, the idea that Lincoln would have held a press conference three days after his uh, election was just not part of the political culture in 1860. Silence was the tradition. He had done no campaigning for the presidency, which was an interesting phenomenon. He was silent from the time he spoke in New York at Cooper Union and gave those ancillary speeches in New England to the time he left Springfield. Very few talks um, because the tradition respected silence and the dignity of, of the presidency. I just want to make one other, one other point about, I mean, obviously the crises are relative. The, the destructiveness of weapons is relative. Lincoln could not have imagined what was to become available in the 21st century, just as George Washington could never have imagined what kind of weaponry would be brought to force in, brought to the fore in the Civil War. But Lincoln is, it, it's never recognized or it's seldom recognized that Lincoln did have a bit of a foreign policy crisis. Um, it, it's it's um, gotten short shrift because of the, of the crisis of the nation, facing the nation itself and its structure. But um, as soon as they started banding about this idea of extending the Missouri Compromise and looking southward for more territory, Lincoln got one diplomatic visit in his entire interregnum, and that was Benito Juarez's minister from Mexico, who came all the way to Springfield, Illinois, to see Lincoln and assure him of the loyalty of the people of Mexico to the justly elected leader of the United States. But that's, that's not all. His name is Matias Romero. I love that name. He also was worried about England and France, knowing as soon as secession started, just as the loyal city of New York and its mayor immediately said, we're going to secede too and become an independent city-state so we can keep up trade with the South, which was on the mind of Mayor Fernando Wood. Um, just as that was happening, Lincoln was contemplating losing Britain and France as, as reliable trade allies, maybe even becoming a military threat again to the United States. So he did have, he was walking a delicate line in foreign policy too. It's just it's been very little studied and underemphasized. The, um, now you would know, uh, you certainly know better than I, but better than most of us, including most of the experts. Lincoln, I was always fascinated by how Lincoln spoke about the importance of the American experience with democracy and keeping it all together and, and not losing it, uh, how that was important to the whole world and how for all the days to come um, uh, after Lincoln, he said, you know, we, will, we can impress this lesson, lesson on the entire globe. And he kept insisting on that, that we're not speaking just for this moment or just for this nation, but for the whole world. But for all time to come. I mean, that, both, that, yeah. that was a, a kind of a startling um, um, foresight, don't you think? I do. It, um, and he said it in, with increasing passion and, and emphasis as he finished some of his less successful inaugural journey speeches and got to the East Coast. It's, well, I think he was inspirited by being in the places where the Founding Fathers had been. When he gets to Trenton, he talks about the original idea, something we fought, we fought for that could light the future generations. I think there was a little political calculation to it, too, because a lot of his coalition was made up of refugees from the wars of 1848 in Europe. He had a big German-American following. And um, America's role as a beacon to the world was crucial to those people who harbored hopes of returning. How, how did the rest of the world re uh, react to his election? Total perplexity. By yeah. the time the news reached England and France, I mean, a wonderful comment by a British aristocrat was, I'm looking at the portraits of the two American presidents, 
this dignified looking man from Kentucky and this other slob from Kentucky. And I must say, judging by the photographs, one looks like a president and the other looks like a farmer. Sir mm -hmm. Alexander Beresford Hope. Um, I think the, the aristocrats in, and, and the working men's groups in Europe had not yet understood that Lincoln would, would um, become a friend of free labor because they just saw him as a, you know, sort of a bumpkin. I think that is an immense difference between the two experiences. Uh, now, we're just back, Matilda and I, from, from Italy. Matilda was there for three weeks. But I, I, I'm, I was astonished to see in Rome plastered on all the walls um, uh, posters on Obama. And the people were just wild with excitement about his victory. And I'm, I'm told that's true in most of Europe uh, and in most of the world. And they see a new reason for hope. There was something, there was something about it. Obama, I thought, had something very much in common with Lincoln and Roosevelt. He has this gift for great speech and great poetry. Uh, it sounds like poetry when he says it, but it, when you read their words, and this is true of Lincoln and Roosevelt as well, they're very simple words. They're very simple ideas, and they're almost all simple morality that you can accept. You know, we're all in this thing together. We should all be thinking like a family. You know, the whole world should come together. Um, and uh, that has caught fire around the world. I mean, even the enemies of, uh, or people who appear to be uh, quasi hostile with us in this are, are talking with respect about Obama and looking forward to engaging with him. Um, but nothing like that happened for Lincoln. It happened overseas only after the assassination when news ah. of his well, the emancipation changed his image in Europe. Right. When, when, um, when uh, he's murdered and we see this explosion of portraiture here in the United States, banners and prints and photographs, it, it, it reaches overseas as well. And, and you see images printed of Abramo Lincoln in Italy in which he looks like, sort of a, uh, it looks like an Italian man and right. the ones in England may give him very thin lips. He looks British. He, his image actually flowers the most in places where freedom blossoms the least. Uh -huh. So in France, where there's a dictator, um, um, Victor Hugo and others uh, intentionally strike a medal to Lincoln and, and defy the dictator. And uh, so he does, but it, not until his martyrdom, not until the achievements of peace. You know, it, it struck me that President Bush has done what Lincoln did in terms of making that sort of, it's almost a presumptuous assertion, it didn't sound so when Lincoln, when I read it, but, uh, about Lincoln, but the idea that America had a responsibility to light the world, to be the example of democracy. I mean, obviously, President Bush has done that, has pursued that more aggressively than Lincoln did overseas. But, and, and Bush always quotes Lincoln about that, that it's, he learned it from Lincoln. Two, two questions I have for you. The, um, uh, this is easier than arguing with him, you know, I, I, I ask him a question. <laughs> the, the, we have to argue about the Constitution a little bit. About you, you want to argue about the Constitution? No, ask me, I like when you ask that, me questions, because you you've never, I've known you for 30 years, you've never asked me a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where were you? Where I am I? You, you asked yeah, me that. Right. The, the uh, Lincoln and religion. Um, uh, religion's a very, very big subject. I mean, a lot bigger than some people will accept, because it, it impinges on so many parts of our life. And, and trying to figure out what the role of religion is in making policy is a very difficult time. We, we've invented a whole language here about culture wars, which basically means that there are people who get together as parties even and say, we're going to fight for our religion in the Congress. And they make their judgments on the basis of their religion, which is a very divisive thing, uh, unless you you, you, uh, when you start getting exquisite about your religion and, and saying things like, you know, I can just imagine the first Jewish president uh, saying everybody's got to be kosher. You know, uh, <laughs> it doesn't work well. So, so tell us about Lincoln's re uh, religion. It was a source of, I mean, he was, uh, he got the same treatment that um, the senator-elect from North Carolina got charges when he first ran for Congress that he wasn't a true Christian. 
and he did battle in the newspapers to prove that he was not a, uh, uh, you know, he wasn't an agnostic. But what was he? That's more to the more to the point. He actually ran against a minister named Peter Cartwright for Congress, and Cartwright and he attended Cartwright's rally, and Cartwright said, "All those who are going to." Uh, to heaven, please stand up. And of course, everybody but three people who had sinned the night before stood up. He said, all those who were going to hell stand up. And the three sinners sheepishly stood up and hung their head. Everybody was standing up except Lincoln. He said, excuse me, I see my opponent is in the audience. Mr. Lincoln, if you're not going to heaven, you're not going to hell. May I inquire where your destination is? And he said, if it's all the same to you, I'm going to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> he never joined a church. <laughs> And, and uh, his wife was a member of the Presbyterian Church in Springfield. Lincoln went occasionally. He was very angry that the ministers in Springfield, his hometown, were almost unified against him. He said, how could they be the, uh, the spokesman for God in our community and support a candidate who believes that human beings can be enslaved? How can that be? What, how can I belong to a church where that's the gospel? We've, we've disagreed now about what happens when he becomes president. Well, we disagreed privately. He does certainly read the Bible. He takes the Bible, he absorbs it, and uses, it, uses the Bible in, in so many speeches. The House Divided and the Second Inaugural, which is, as we've written together in a, in a gallery note we once wrote, is an Old Testament condemnation of anyone who tolerated the sin of human slavery, right out of Leviticus, I think. Um, but basically, what it, his philosophy, I think he expresses it beautifully one day, and that's, when I do good, I feel good, and that's my religion. It's sort of Sermon on the Mount kind of religion. <clears throat> and um, the only time he invokes a, uh, an angry God is to um, justify the bloodshed for the war. So it's a very complicated, a very complicated record. And um, I think he believed in fate, but he wasn't sure about God's will. As you point out, he prayed, but he didn't think God talked to him. Yeah. The, um, this is a final thought for me, I think, because I, you get to hear what the audience wants to hear about. Um, in terms of religion, I, I, I think we've missed a big opportunity to give religion its proper role in our society. Uh, terrorism is, to some extent, religious because of this mm -hmm. uh, um, aberrant and, and, I think, unreasonable view that some people take of the Koran and, and what, it, what it means. And uh, as I say, most of the Muslims regard the jihadists as uh, a desecration of, of the Koran. But after 9-11, I remember being asked what we should do at the site, at Ground Zero. And I said, I think what you should do at the site of Ground Zero is that whatever else you do, is to build an annex to the, to the United Nations. Every, the, Every governor, uh, I included, and the governor before me and the governors after me, have been importuned by the United Nations to help them to expand because the world is expanding and uh, the world of representation is expanding. So they need more space. I said, use Ground Zero as an annex to the United Nations and then put in front of it in some form pillars and have the pillars represent each of the religions that we recognize as a nation. Now, under the First Amendment, it talks only about religion. Religion has to be defined, and it's defined by the Supreme Court. And it's defined in a way that includes atheism. Uh, the way they uh, handle the religion in the Supreme Court is to say there are three theistic religions, starting with Judaism, three God-oriented religions, Judaism, then Christianity, born of Judaism, and then Islam, uh, the Koran. They're all the God religion. But then there's Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, and ethical humanism, which is basically atheism. And that's a religion too. So, uh, because it's a, uh, it's a series of rules and it's organized. Okay. Now, what you do then is look at all those religions and take their basic proposition. And you start with Judaism and that's all you need because Judaism has the two principles that we've talked about so much and written about, and that is uh, tzedakah and tikkun olam. And tzedakah basically is see yourselves as uh, children of the same God and treat yourself accordingly. Actually, they think of it as a matter of justice, I think. So that's tzedakah. And what is your mission? Tikkun olam, the world needs to be repaired. The world's impact. 
But if you go to Christ and Christianity, um, he comes out of the synagogue and some of the disdainers stop him in the street and say, gee, the rabbis are all talking about what a smart guy you are. What is it you're telling them? And he says, uh, I'm telling him a very simple thing. I said, uh, the, you want to know the law? The whole law is uh, love one another as you love yourself for the love of me and I'm truth. And the truth is that God made this world but didn't complete it. And you ought to be collaborators with him in creation to make it a better world and keep the creation going. And they said, yeah, but that's Judaism. And he says, I'm a Jew. You know, and, and, uh, and Hillel, of course, says the, exactly the same thing. You know, uh, you love one another, etc. Everything else is commentary. So you take that, and then and and the Koran says that, and every religion that the Supreme Court recognizes says it one way or another: do unto others. It's very simple. And if you just stayed with the two basic rules of Judaism, you could govern that way. That's that's enough for a politics. And that's where Lincoln, I think, was religious. You know, and 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 when he spoke about religion, he spoke about it in those very simple terms. You know, but, he, also, he also had tests. He could have become a know-nothing, an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant politician, and he rejected it specifically, which was unusual for his time. And, and in, in the, at the beginning of the Civil War, when Ulysses S. Grant, a rising general, bans Jews from the Kentucky area that he commands, the rabbis, including uh, uh, Rabbi Wise came to the White House and asked Lincoln to overturn the, uh, the order banning Jews. And Lincoln did that at great peril because Grant was the only general who was successful. Um, and also, he was uh, appealed to by New York rabbis to change the, uh, the law that allowed chaplains, that mandated that chaplains had to be of some legitimate Christian denomination. He had the word Christian struck from the law so that the first rabbis could be, uh, and by that, I'm, I, that is just further evidence of this universality that he felt about, about all men. Don't you think we ought to Yeah, I'd love to hear questions. questions. Sure. How do we do it, I guess? Gov, you want to call on? This gentleman here has a question. Uh, it, it, it is a tough question. So, did everyone of, hear? Would you? Um, what would you suggest to Obama in writing his speech? Um, the uh, Abraham Lincoln decided uh, to stay with just the two big issues, and which are really one. It's a tandem, and that is slavery and what it means to the Union, and keeping the Union together. Uh, do you want to concentrate on that, or would you go into the whole series of issues that I say exist now? I, I think the practical thing is not to try to do the whole series, because there are just too many of them. You know, what it would come out to is a litany. I think what you need to do in that first speech, which uh, Lincoln did so magnificently well, is state the basic rationale you have, you know, what your basic operating principle is. Are you going to be a fiercely partisan, uh, liberal Democrat? Are you going to be this or that? And, and this notion that, well, you're not going to be. You're not going to be a, 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 an extreme uh, ideologue. You're going to be practical about your approach, and your approach is um, in, instead of going to war um, uh, to preempt people, you know, talk first. You're going, and so, so just state the general propositions that are going to guide you in your governance. Uh, there are some specific questions that have to be dealt with, and he's got to assure the world that the world, not just the country, that he has a good idea as to how to manage the economy and how to get us out of this mess. Now, that's mostly in, in place for him already. I mean, that, that's being started, and by the end of his 77 days, 
You know, Paulson has already gone through one change in what he was going to do with all that money. There, there'll probably be more changes after that. But he, he has to be uh, he has to be specific, I think, uh, on that subject. Um, but uh, you know, Harold would know better because Harold is himself one of the, the great writers of, of speeches and certainly a great student of well-written speeches by Lincoln. And uh, you know, what do you think? What would you say, say to Obama? And what parts of, Obama says he's going to use Lincoln's speeches. You know, what he parts says of he's Lincoln's reading, speeches he's do you think he should now. use? You know, Lincoln, I, of course, had many issues that, that uh, led him to political life originally, including canals, railroads, all of those things. But from 1854 on, anyone in his party who tried to derail the conversation from slavery, he said, was, he used a recently discovered letter he called it idiotic. So he was completely focused on this, the decision that he thought had to come. As he put it, the tug has to come, and better now than ever. Um, but I will tell you something interesting, and this is like unsolicited advice to Senator Obama. If you're angry about anything, if you're angry about something that happens in the next 30 days, if you're angry about opponents who may try to say something disagreeable, um, write it down in your inaugural, and we know Senator Obama's a writer too, and then get it off your chest, and then make sure you tone things down. Lincoln's the inaugural that he wrote over the grocery store, Mr. Lincoln, that inaugural was quite different from the one he delivered. He, he toned it down. Originally it ended with the, the, the dare to the South, shall it be peace or a sword? And he was convinced by a series of readers that he can't do it. And it ended instead with a call to the better angels of our nature, which was much wiser. So I think it's got to go through several iterations. But I agree with you that it should focus on a couple of things. This one back there. The, the question is, Lincoln seemed to have inner direction and uh, focus and the ability to be introspective. Uh, Senator Obama seems to have the same quality, but in this age of, of uh, pressure and many handlers and many advisors, can he keep that inner focus? And I don't know, I would just say that I astonish at how many adjectives you read about Lincoln that are also applied to Obama. I'll let the governor give the prediction, but cool is a word that was used about Lincoln, and sometimes not happily. People would say he was too cool. He was distant. He was also disloyal to his political supporters. In other words, he didn't pick his hometown folks to go with him. Um, he changed, uh, he, he, he shed friends who weren't useful to him or the country and moved on. So there was a certain dispassionateness about him that I think th there is a similarity there. I see it anyway. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the one thing that I've said this already once, let me say it a second time because I think it's so important. The one, one thing that strikes me is being held in common by uh, the communicators, Roosevelt, Lincoln, and now Obama, is they speak simply. I mean, it, it's, they put it together in a way that makes it sound like poetry. But the ideas are <clears throat> very, very simple. And you'll recall that that's what we tried to do, too. You take the basic political issue. The basic political issue is what is the role of government, okay? And Reagan comes and says big government is terrible and smaller government is better and no government would be perfect, I guess. Uh, and, 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 you know, Lincoln handles that beautifully. And it, it's a good example of how he thought and how he reduced things to language and even ideas that people uh, whether they're well-educated or not, could understand. He didn't talk about big government, little government, uh, uh, and getting all involved in that. He said simply, look, government is the coming together of people to do for one another collectively. Uh, that, that is, as a government, to do for one another collectively what they could not do as well or at all privately, which is through the market. And so translated, that is, if the market can do it for you, let the market do it. Government shouldn't be the first choice.
But if the market doesn't do it, then you, you have to get together, that's government, and do it. Now, look at how it worked. Because the Constitution never said uh, that health care should be a right, you know, that should have been tacked on to the Bill of Rights. You know, everybody has the right to get help when they're sick, you know. And education, those two things. Um, uh, the, the, the Constitution never said that. And uh, the market never provided it. And so for over 100 years, people died because they were sick and old and didn't have Medicare. Uh, or they died because they were poor and didn't have health care, didn't have Medicaid. Uh, but it took over 100 years, 1965, we finally decided. And education, there are still people without education. The federal government doesn't say anything about uh, education. They help out a little bit, but they left it to the states. That's what public schools were. So, so you know, that, that is the approach in communicating. When, we, when I wrote my first inaugural, I reduced that all into, uh, here's what all those geniuses meant. Uh, and it's what I believe. I believe in all the government you need, but I believe in only the government you need. And that, that was, I think, a fair uh, version of what Lincoln was saying and a good example of how simple he could make things for us. And I think Obama has that same gift. You know, uh, just a quick plug and then a comment about your, your, your governorship. There, I'm, I'm, it's unwise from a marketing point of view, which is what I'm supposed to know about, but there's another book coming out in January called In Lincoln's Hand, which is going to be a catalog for the official bicentennial Lincoln exhibition at the Library of Congress, the highest tech reproductions of Lincoln's writings, actual handwriting ever produced through all these great new technologies. And uh, the co-editor and I called on leading uh, Americans and a couple of people who aren't Americans from literary figures like John Updike and E.L. Doctorow and Toni Morrison to write comments and uh, political leaders like um, um, all the former presidents and uh, Newt Gingrich and Mario Cuomo and he selected that piece in its handwritten form to do. But you left out of this last litany something that Obama's gonna find out. Your, one of your most memorable phrases is that orators speak in poetry, but, governor, but people have to govern in prose, and it's not as easy in a way. And people who are gifted, or, of, who, of, of people who are the most gifted orators, sometimes an unreasonable amount is expected instantaneously. Well, you know, it was obviously not as instantaneous, but compar compared to the generation earlier, it was practically instantaneous. When he speaks here at Cooper Union downtown, uh, he goes to a party afterwards, and then he goes to the offices of the New York Tribune and reads two proofs, two sets of proofs to get it, make sure it's right. The next morning, this pool edition appears in the Times, the, the Tribune, the New York Herald, uh, the New York Tribune, and one other paper that I'm now forgetting, which is bad, but all of these papers pick it up the next morning, and, and then, oh, the New York Evening Post picks it up in the afternoon. Um, and then within a week, it's in pamphlets, and it's in German, and it's in English, and it's distributed all over, reprinted. So I would say within two or three days, as was the experience with the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And um, as a person whose words were often garbled by stenographers, Lincoln learned that he had to read the proof himself, so he was a real master of, and con he controlled it. Anybody else? The, uh, let, me, let me take a, um, a shot at this. The, I, I think there are, at, at this stage, and so early, we're going to know so much more um, in, in several weeks. But right now, I see two big, of all this galaxy of big issues, but two 
big issues. One, good for Obama politically, maybe not for the country, but politically good for Obama. The other, dangerous for Obama. And the one is the economy, and the other is the war in Afghanistan. The economy is going to be a good issue for Obama politically in the long run, because it's absolutely clear that he didn't create the economic problem. He comes into the uh, presidency with the problem having been loaded onto the shoulders of Bush and the last eight years. That's the way it works. Whether That is not defensible, I don't think, in terms of logic, et cetera. But you get credit for good things that happen while you're there, whether you have anything to do with them or not. And you get the burden of the bad things that happen when you're there, whether you... <laughs> and so I was most popular when we were ha making money and I could cut your taxes. I was unpopular when we, the economy was lousy and I raised your taxes. So, so that's, just, that's just the way it works. So he starts with not carrying the burden of the economy himself. It is not just apt to, but I think bound to get better over the next four years. It, it's going to take a while. You won't see it next year. Maybe you'll begin to see it more the year after. But certainly by the time he's finished his four years, the economy will be strong again. And he will get credit for that. You know, it was bad. You made him president. Now it's good. That's good for him. Afghanistan is something else. And I, I've, I mean, this is another issue that I've talked a lot about, like the religion issue, but nobody else seems to be interested in it. The, I think the, the, Obama made a lot of points by being against the war in Iraq, and certainly did with me and with a lot of people I know. He was against the war in Iraq. And uh, so what most Americans and most people around the world. He then went further and continues to make points by saying, I'm going to take uh, the, the forces out of Iraq and I'm going to send them home, which is the first thing he said, and which is what the Democrats said in 2006, and that's how they got power in the Congress, by saying, we're going to end the war in Iraq and bring the, the troops home. Well, they're not going to bring the troops home. If he ends the war in Iraq and gets the troops out of Iraq, they're going to Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan was a war we all voted for, not formally, but in our hearts, right after 9-11. But that was eight years ago, and it was because Osama bin Laden was there, it's because al-Qaeda was there, and it's because the Taliban were there. And so it was absolutely right to go to Afghanistan. The mistake was to, in the middle of the war in Afghanistan, when we were just getting started, to pull troops out and go into Iraq, okay? So now the war in Afghanistan is going to be Obama's war because he's going to have to take the troops out of Iraq, and he has said it more than once, and we have to go to Pakistan and we have to go to Afghanistan and we have to win there. I don't know how you win there. If al-Qaeda is hidden up in Wazikistan or wherever it is in the mountains, and if they're hiding there and you send 20,000 troops their way, they're not going to stay there. They're going to leave the way they left Baghdad. They don't have a place, these terrorists, uh, al-Qaeda. They go wherever they have to go, Malaysia, etc. So you're not going to beat them that way. The Taliban, they're talking to, but I, they're a troublesome group too. And Pakistan, which we gave billions of dollars to already to Musharraf, uh, that, you know, Pakistan does, most of the people there don't want us there. Now we're talking about crossing the line into to, uh, the Pakistan to shoot enemies because they're shooting at Americans, and the Pakistanis are blaming us for that. So it's a mess. I think that's going to be the biggest problem for Obama at the end. So the economy after four years is going to be good for him. The war in Iraq is maybe going to be softened, but that war in Afghanistan and Pakistan is going to be a really big burden on uh, Obama. That's the way I see it. Now, he's got a lot of other issues in between health care. He has signaled that he's going to do something about health care. And, and th this gets very complicated. Where do you get the money to do all these things? 
Well, let me say, we're running out of time, but let me just jam this in because I think it's a very important point. Uh, people always ask the same question. Where did you get the money to do that? Where, well, you, you, got, you'll get the mo you could get the money to fight the war. How did, how did you get $2 trillion to fight the Second uh, World War? How did you do that? They, 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 there was a, a, a huge depression. Where did you get $2 trillion to fight the Second World War? Um, where did you get the $700 billion that you've just agreed to give to? And then there was $100 billion here, and there's $100 billion there. Where do you get the money? Uh, well, uh, you can't do it because you have to balance your checkbook. And I couldn't do it as governor because the state has to balance its budget. But the federal government doesn't have to balance anything. It can produce dollar bills. It has a machine. Now, if I could have the machine, I would use it. But I would <laughs> But I would go to jail. You know, so they use it and they get reelected. Uh, so, so, but, but, but it really comes down to this. You, they literally make paper. And if you do too much of it, it brings down empires. And it's the way the Roman Empire went down. It's the way all the big empires were. Paul Kennedy wrote that book. On, and, and it's the way all the great empires have gone down. Well, gee, well then, because if you make too many bills, they get so cheap that the dollar doesn't mean anything, you get, become Zimbabwe, where the inflation is 150% or something like that. Uh, now, that w that's the danger here. We can keep running a deficit until people say, you're not going to pay us on time in full, and so we're going to stop lending you money. The Chinese are now the biggest lenders to the United States. Chinese are the biggest lenders to the United States. And so we're running deficits, and they're giving us the money to run our government, large part of it. The Chinese were asked recently by Fareed Zakaria, they're, they're, uh, you know, he's the foreign policy guy you see now, and he's a very smart guy. And he was talking to the leader of the Chinese government, who was really the prime minister. And, uh, and he was asked, he says, when are you going to stop, are you going to stop lending money to these people? Of course, they're broke, you know. They, they had a $500 billion deficit, the Americans, last year in their budget. How, why are you lending them money? He says, well, we're going to continue lending them. Why? Because they're good for it. It's just like borrowing money from the bookmaker in South Jamaica in the old days. <laughs> you, know, you know, Charlie, I need, no, Rocky, I need a little money. Uh, I've got to pay my rent. Uh, how much do you need? $40. Well, I'll give it to you five for six, you know, but, but you better be here unless you want your legs broken <laughs> next week. So, but it's the same thing with the Chinese. They said the United States is the biggest economy in the world. The United States is good for the money. The United States is going to get better. And the United States are our best customers, which we are now. We're the biggest customers. So, so that, that, that's the economy. And it will work its way out. We can run deficits. And despite all the talk about how bad deficits are by Republicans, Republicans are the ones who have given us the biggest deficits. Reagan gave us the biggest deficit in history, in his years, and now George Bush beat him with the biggest deficit in history. But we can survive it, and Obama will survive it, and the country will survive it, and we'll be strong again, because we'll get back to making money and, and you know, paying our debts and our paper will be meaningful again. But that's a, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Did I you, know how, you think I confuse people with I, that? No? I think there won't be any more questions, that's for sure. But you know how I would leave it? I would leave it this way. I feel positive because Barack Obama is listening to Abraham Lincoln. I would feel even better if he was listening to Mario Cuomo. No. Yeah, yeah, let it go. We lock it up. What's hmm. next? That's my final. Uh, I think they want to go home now. I Just think they want to go home. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>